Hello and welcome to the MIT Faculty Forum. I'm Karen Weintraub, an MIT Knight Fellow from the class of 09 and a freelance health and science journalist, and I'll serve as today's moderator. As a reminder, we welcome your questions during this chat. For MIT alumni joining us via Zoom, please use the Q&A feature found on your toolbar. For all others listening on YouTube, you may add your questions to the comments field. We'll also take questions and comments on Twitter using hashtag MIT Better World. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Today, we hear from a panel of experts who will share some of their current projects and research since leaving MIT as postdocs in the biology and biotech space. We're gonna start with an overview from each of the panelists. You might catch us up on your career since leaving MIT and talk about your current projects. First up is Nik Nikhil Josh Joshi, excuse me, Nikhil Joshi, who is now an assistant professor in the Department of Immunobiology at the Yale University School of Medicine. While at MIT, Dr. Joshi worked in the lab of Tyler Jacks using models and other advanced approaches to investigate how immune cells interact with developing tumors. He won the 2017 Scientific Merit Award from the Lung Cancer Research Foundation. Dr. Joshi. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation uh, and, and happy to be here to talk, talk about what I've been doing and, and um, how I started. So basically, I when I was a postdoc in Tyler's lab, I developed an interest in cancer immunology and really how we could use mouse models to address uh, complex questions in cancer immunology. So there was a number of models that had been developed by cancer biologists over, over many years, and they weren't exactly ideal to use for, for cancer immunology questions. And we figured by modifying these models and really developing tools, we could start to ask questions that were very difficult to ask at that point. And so in my own lab, we've, we've taken that same approach, both designing and developing models and also uh, using models that we had generated when I was a postdoc and others in the field have generated to ask some basic questions in cancer immunology. So we really focus on two central areas. The first is uh, the central question. My lab works on T cells and their interactions with tumors as they're developing in the, in the body. And so we ask two central questions. The first is how these immune cells, these T cells, actually help to shape the development of a tumor. And then the second question is how does the, the different tumor microenvironments of different types of tumors, so say a lung cancer versus a, a melanoma, how does that impact the function of the T cells as the tumors develop? And so we've been doing this uh, now for about a year and a half and, and a large part of that has just been setting up the models. Uh, but one thing that that's been, allow been allowing me to do is also to go back a little bit more to my roots. I was an immunologist before I went to MIT and asked some more basic questions about T cell biology. And so we're also expanding into the, into the areas of peripheral tolerance, which is a, just a property which, by which T cells in the body don't attack the, yourself. And we're trying to understand some of the mechanisms using some of the models that I developed to study cancer immunology now uh, within this space. Fascinating, really cool. Um, next up is Dr. Versha Banerjee, a senior scientist at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Banerjee graduated from MIT in 2007. And while she was in Cambridge, she worked at both the Broad Institute and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And she continues now to search for less toxic ways to treat leukemia. Dr. Banerjee? Sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you very much um, uh, for that introduction. So I actually started in 2007 at MIT oh, sorry. Okay. and I finished in 2011 and I was in the lab of Kimberly Steigmeier um, at, in the cancer research program under Todd uh, Golub. And um, my focus during that time was to look for um, different ways to target acute myeloid leukemia cells, um, mainly using cell lines as the model and either using genetic or um, uh, drug perturbations um, and determining whether or not cells um, could move from a leukemic state to a non-leukemic state based on uh, the different perturbations that we um, put them through. And um, I completed this work in 2012 and um, then I moved back to uh, my roots, which uh, were in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I'm a physician by training, an internist and a hematologist. Um, and so I had the luxury of combining both the basic realm with the clinical realm. And I established a practice in chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And I established a program where my model of research is actually using primary patient samples and leukemia cells from them to um, try and uh, develop develop and understand ways in which drugs that may um, be approved by the FDA or those that are still being made, um, for example, from the Broad, I have the opportunity to test some of their samples in these primary leukemia cells. 
and try and determine their mechanisms of action um, and in the way in which um, they die. Um, finally, we've now uh, moved uh, away from this. So we're still doing a lot of drug screening in primary samples, but we're trying to understand that cell death may not be the best phenotype to try and target. And so we're now looking at um, changes in the metabolism of these cells, mainly um, by targeting mitochondrial enzymes that are aberrantly expressed um, in leukemia cells versus is um, uh, normal cells and trying to target uh, these enzymes um, in a phenotype that causes the mitochondria in the cancer cells, but not the normal cells to slow down and therefore lead to a cell death phenotype. And therefore this is happening um, as we can see with lower concentrations of drugs that are normally used in clinical practice. And therefore we feel that this might enable us to treat patients better, um, have them experience lower side effects from existing medications, but also use certain medications and combinations in better ways through clinical trials. Thank you. Great. Really interesting. Thank you. We'll get back, get some more details in a few minutes on that. Um, our last panelist is Dr. Daniel Heller, who graduated, I believe, in 2010 uh, and is now an assistant professor at the Weill Cornell Medical College of Cornell University, New York City. Uh, at MIT, Dr. Heller did a postdoc in the lab of infamous inventor Rob Langer, where he wrote a paper with Dr. Langer about treating metastatic cancer with nanotechnology, work that he continues today and will tell us about. Dr. Hi. Heller. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I was uh, very fortunate to be working, uh, to have worked with both uh, Mike Strano uh, in um, the chemical engineering department and, uh, and also uh, uh, Bob uh, when I um, moved to, to start my postdoc in the Coke. So, um, so that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. And I, um, I learned a lot about uh, nanotechnology, uh, development of nanomaterials, I actually have some slides. You want me to show them now or later? All right, should I go ahead? Let's see if I can do this. There it is. Um, let's see. So um, yeah, my lab uh, started in, let's see. So can you all see uh, that? Um, a, uh, yes, we can. OK. So um, so my, my lab uh, uh, started in 2012, and uh, now it's been uh, uh, five years. and um, I've been very lucky to be in a, in a, in a uh, move from the Koch Institute to a cancer center where I can uh, interact with the uh, uh, clinicians. There's my lab uh, right now. Um, I'm on the 18th floor of this skyscraper in Manhattan. Uh, that's where we are. And um, my lab does, um, uh, and, and we're right across the street from a, the hospital there, the Sloan Kettering uh, Hospital. Uh, we're in the Upper East Side, which uh, you can see there. And so uh, my position is uh, both at Sloan Kettering and Cornell uh, Medical College. And, um, and kind of, I think of my, my, we think of ourselves, we kind of came into this, into this space, so we go back to that. We came into this space as a, as a bunch of engineers and, um, and started uh, learning a whole lot about, uh, more, more about cancer biology that I think uh, Nick kind of knew and, and, we, and we kind of were engineers and had to learn on the, on the fly. And so kind of uh, sitting in this cancer center, uh, realizing that uh, we're the only ones who were, or one of the very few people that didn't know uh, nearly as much biology, um, we uh, kind of, uh, uh, all, all the postdocs that started with me uh, kind of felt like we were uh, learning, uh, you know, learning uh, uh, as, as the MIT students do, like, uh, like a, um, uh, uh, like, like from a getting, getting a, a drink from a fire hose. And, um, and and learning about cancer biology uh, on the ground. So we uh, started thinking ourselves. We were thinking of ourselves as the engineers. We're making you know like rocket engines, but instead uh, very nano uh, materials, nano particles to uh, detect and, and and treat cancer. And we started collaborating with the, the biologists, um, and we started making research tools and and, and working with them uh, to see how we can make the uh, tools that will really accelerate the, the work try to make sensors that detect, uh, that can detect cancer, mostly kind of goes back to some of the work I did as a, a PhD student with Mike Strano, and then learning how we can apply that to cancer research, and then collaborating with the doctors, people just like this, but maybe um, not uh, uh, maybe not on TV, and, uh, and learning about the, uh, how we can make better diagnostics and therapies. And so we kind of uh, um, really uh, uh, 
found ourselves kind of collaborating a lot with the people around us who were all either biologists or doctors. And um, and so our- Dan, do you mind, sorry, do you mind putting it on presentation? It's a little small on this. Okay, uh, say, say that again, doing it Put it on, on presentation mode rather than Oh, I realize, right, I put the presentation mode went to, um, went to the other, went to the other side. Um, okay. So I've been, I've been uh, selecting slides on the wrong, on the wrong screen. Sorry about oh, that. Okay. So, um, so this, Thanks. Uh, so my lab um, uh, uh, is basically spends its time making uh, probes and, and, uh, and sensors as well as uh, nanoparticles. And um, yeah, sorry, I don't think the presenter really works on that screen, but I'll just, uh, um, and so it's, uh, but I've been uh, uh, very lucky there to kind of uh, be in this kind of synergistic environment. And then um, I kind of will, I'll go to one more just slide here to show um, that kind of our lab focuses on targeting uh, therapies to both the pathway, the thinking about targeted drugs in this way where we think about uh, targeting a pathway as well as targeting a, uh, the location, making, making the particles that uh, making nano, putting drugs into nanoparticles, targeting them to um, uh, cancer, uh, uh, the sites of cancer and avoiding uh, sites that cause um, the uh, toxic uh, side effects. So let me unshare now. Sorry about that. I realized I was looking at the wrong view, wrong slide, the, the wrong side of it that other people. Nope, no worries. Um, again, if anybody wants to ask questions of the panel, please use the Q&A feature found in the toolbar. Uh, the first question, it's actually a great one, good, a good broad question to start with, is what, where do you see personalized immunotherapy or personalized treatments coming? Um, are, are we going to have them within the next five or 10 years? Uh, how, how realistic are they? So I don't know. Um, who wants to start with that one? I can start. Okay, great. Um, so in the realm of immunotherapy, both in, diff in solid tumors such as lung cancer, melanoma, and within the hematologic cancer world such as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma, immunotherapies are now making their ways into the um, standard of care of treatment in patients. Um, they're uh, easily accessible, um, I would say in the last five to 10 years, mainly in the form of clinical trial, but now um, are available routinely um, when required um, based on the treatment algorithm for that specific cancer. Great. Nick, did you want to take that from your perspective? Yeah, I would uh, just expand on that. I think, you know, there's a lot of different types of personalized immunotherapy that are kind of coming online. And I guess one of the big questions will be whether or not uh, they're necessary in all cases. So I think there will be some, some uh, types of cancers in some situations where it's very difficult to deal with the cancer and you don't get much of a response. You know, certain therapies like anti-CTLA-4 or CD, anti-PD-1 are very successful in a relatively successful in a large number of patients. So it's the patients who don't respond to those where you need this uh, extra boost. And that's where I think the personalized therapies will really come in. Uh, I think it's even also a, much more of a win now, the idea that uh, we're even talking about it because probably five, 10 years ago, the idea of doing personalized cancer therapies was really a very foreign concept, and now it's something that seems very doable uh, in 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 a in a broad setting. And so I think that that's a huge step forward in itself. Uh, and so I, I think it will be a, play a major role, but uh, we'll have to see how the, the the sort of broad therapies play out first, and whether we can afford them. Yeah. Um, Dan, did you want to take that one, or should we? Um, yeah, I I feel that uh, there's going to be. Um, I mean, I I've just been feel feeling very optimistic. Uh, and which is uh, uh, and kind of more optimistic than I than I, I've been in, in um, before, and and I think I kind of felt it here uh, uh, from at a cancer center where uh, where 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 just there's so many um, uh, kind of so much progress in in the last few years, and so um, I think um, uh, I. I I'm, I'm, I think that things are gonna are, are gonna really uh, be making big uh, big headway in the next few years in, in, in immunotherapy in general and, and personalized immunotherapy. Great. The next question um, is: What frustrations or challenges do you have? Oops, sorry, that just disappeared on me. Uh, do you have working with pharma companies? I don't know if any if if you guys do work with pharma uh, directly, but what are the challenges and, and frustrations of that process? So um, I do. Um, 
uh, you have to understand that I'm in a different country and the rules and regulations are different and the access to certain compounds um, is often a little bit more dif difficult and a little bit more challenging. Um, so I, I, you know, I obviously miss that aspect of my training and access to pre-clinical um, um, uh, drugs and the the ties that um, the labs and the academic uh, research forum had with industry. I think that's something that I don't see as much of, especially in a smaller place. I think it might be different in the larger centers such as Vancouver or Toronto. Um, but I, I do actually get a lot of support in the setting of clinical trials, um, trying to get access to therapy. I also, um, because um, our funding scheme is different for care, um, sometimes treatments are available but not funded through the traditional means. And so pharmaceutical companies um, will open compassionate access programs so patient can access um, these types of novel treatments. Um, and then um, unrestricted research funding to help move research programs forward um, are also uh, means that we have uh, to work with industry to try and bring novel treatments to patients, which um, in smaller centers is, is a great um, way to work um, in collaboration with industry and academia. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything to say? <laughs> Dan, no, no. Oh. I'll I'll just say that um, I think that there's there's a lot of opportunities once you start a lab to to take these to to interact with pharmaceuticals, and it kind of depends on what you want. I think uh, um, uh, the previous speaker had a really good point about, uh, especially if you're in patient care, you have a lot of of, of really good opportunities to move the science forward. Um, and it, you always have this question of, do you want to spend your uh, effort uh, working with pharmaceuticals? Because there are challenges associated with it, but they can open a lot of doors. So from my own personal perspective, I, I sort of talked to a lot of pharmaceuticals that hasn't quite uh, come to fruition, but I, I've started to learn uh, that there's, there's, there's unique challenges to that. And I think uh, as a postdoc, I didn't quite appreciate that as much as I do now. So. Dan, anything to add on that one? or? Uh, oh, I, I would definitely echo uh, <laughs> Nick. Um, I know I, I've talked to uh, just uh, uh, having uh, the uh, the ability to to talk to these people and 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 learning from them has has been uh, amazing. Um, we um, I, I certainly get an appreciation of uh, of the process of, of drug development uh, that I couldn't before. I'm uh, um, I'm actually um, and, uh, I'm starting to. I think I'm going to start. To, uh, I'm co-directing a course on drug development uh, in, in the uh, in, in the spring uh, with uh, some pharma, and uh, basically what I'm going to do is sit there and learn from them, and 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 uh, uh, and because I think the drug development process uh, is something that in academia we only hear a little bit about, but but talking to pharma we learn uh, so much more. Great. And uh, somebody had a follow-up for you, Versha, that they would love to hear the Canadian perspective on nationalized medicine and emerging U.S. health policy changes. Uh, so that's, How does that inf influence your work, if, if at all? Um, it does. Ask, it, it influences our work on a regular basis. Um, uh, I will say that um, I work in a public health care system where everyone has equal access to the care. Um, and uh, for cancer treatments um, in my province, um, anything that's given intravenously is covered by the government and anything that is now available in oral, oral format, so taken by mouth, is also now covered as long as it's been approved through a national um, process that has deemed the evidence um, behind the clinical trials to be effective, which I know is not the case um, in the United States and the system's mainly based on who can either pay for it out of pocket or the insurance um, companies that might fund them depending on what your coverage is. So um, my opportunities to bring uh, treatments to patients is actually um, a little bit greater. Um, I have patients, um, my practice is mainly of elderly patients where 10 years ago I had two options for treatment that has expanded greatly um, to uh, multiple options either in the form of chemotherapy or oral treatments. And as a result, um, I'm not 
using uh, age or other discriminating factors in choosing who I would give these treatments to. Everyone would have equal access to the treatments, which um, means a 98-year-old is as eligible for treatment as a 35-year-old, um, which has totally changed how I practice medicine. Um, but without the research that happens behind, I wouldn't even have those things to offer them. So I think um, it, it is a different system. I lived in the States. I benefited from the system there. Your farm more efficient. You have easy access to care. Um, your wait times are less. But when it comes to providing sort of these um, more expensive therapies, um, I can see how that can be challenging in the United States. Sort of following up on that too is: Do you face funding woes? Um, you know, is that stymieing your research? How how much is that keeping you up at night? <laughs> in the Canadian environment. Yeah, uh, and our, then the our, other two in the U.S. Our granting schemes um, are under fire currently. So in order to pay for public health care and public education um, and uh, public child care subsidies, um, we lose in other aspects. So the government funding for research is quite um, limited and tight. Um, we've gone through a restructuring through national agencies. And the other thing that is um, different is that the maximum value of the grants here is far, far less than the maximum value of grants um, that are awarded in the United States, unless you're part of these multi-million dollar team um, grants. Um, and being in a smaller institution, uh, those opportunities are also less. And so um, we've had, when I started my career in 2011, um, it was the lowest funding um, rates for grants. Um, we're currently probably still sitting in the seven to nine percent of people who are funded amongst all different types of competitions. And you're looking at 60 to 100 thousand dollars a year for the budget that you're working with. So our salaries are not included, which is different than the United States. Our universities or clinical practice or what other means provide our salary um, income, but salaries for everybody who works with within the labs and all the reagents would then fall to the grants. Right, so nobody has the, the labs, the Langer sized labs with 150 uh, <laughs> postdocs or whatever. Well, not the 150, but <laughs> I mean, Toronto and Vancouver do have some large scale labs with multi-million dollar fundings, um, uh, but often they are competitive enough to actually apply for US granting um, and are successful in the US um, granting uh, agency. So they may actually have some of the NIH funding and some major CIHR funding, um, but those are um, few and far between uh, in the Canadian global environment. And Dan and Nick, do, are you guys up at night uh, worrying about funding? Yeah, I haven't. I don't think I've reached the stage yet where, I, where I'm up. At, I'm still too new. I'm still in the honeymoon <laughs> phase, I think, of, of running a lab. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't scare me yet, uh, the, the application for funding. I think you, the, the odds are, are not always great, uh, but uh, we like what we do. And I think you just write, write more grants at this point and, and just hope for the best. Uh, but I think in general, most people will find funding for what they're working on. And so as long as you can communicate your science and work on interesting things, I think uh, there will be granting agencies that will fund it. So at least I'm hopeful. That MIT confidence, right? Yeah. <laughs> Dan? Um, yeah, what, uh, yeah, what Versha said about the starting when, when the, it's, it was at the worst uh, it had ever been uh, was, um, you know, I always like to be optimistic. So I thought, well, if, uh, if it's the worst there been, hopefully it can, it'll go up from here. Um, and so it, it has gotten slightly better than 2012 when I started, but uh, not uh, a whole lot better. Um, I was, and now it's, um, it's been five years. So, um, and I think I put in about 14 uh, NI, big NIH grants and finally, the first one hit uh, very recently. So, um, so I feel like I got that uh, by the skin of my teeth. And um, and now, especially with timing for thinking about going up for you know to to, to stay here and in, in, in a promotion tenure type uh, track at things. Uh, so, um, so I was very lucky at that very moment. But I was lucky at the beginning that I get a um, uh, this new innovator uh, grant, and so that was that kept uh, me going. But I mean. I just feel like um, I've been been you know lucky enough to 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 stay in the game, and it's of course um, uh, because I've been submitting 
things left and right. Um, and so um, hopefully with the next uh, budget that, you know, it's um, not going to uh, throw a big, um, uh, you know, you know get, uh, throw us for a loop. But um, uh, so I guess I can keep remaining cautious, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Great. Um, switching gears for a minute, somebody asks, uh, are you, are any of you holding out hope for CRISPR to be behind major advances in your labs? Anybody a CRISPR fan? Always. Oh, yeah. Probably Nick, you're, you're the guy to talk about CRISPR. I could just say, I'm pretty sure it'll be useful in general. Uh, or it's going to be, it is obviously going to, is useful now. It's going to be useful in general. Uh, and for therapeutic applications is what I always think about with drug delivery is uh, can someone put CRISPR in a nanoparticle and target it to a certain location in the body and, and, uh, and make that a therapeutic method. And I think a lot of people in my field have been thinking about that a lot. And I think uh, they're, gonna, they're, they're, they're starting to get traction in the lab and I think it's gonna get somewhere in, in the clinic in the hopefully not too distant future. Yeah, I think, I think these days in, in biology research, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that you, you would get away without using it. It's, uh, um so pervasive, it's, it's every, every lab is using it. It's really democratized sort of the ability to do certain types of research in, in both in different species and, and also uh, in, in, in every lab can now make knockouts. So uh, we, of course, like every, most labs use it. I think, um, I don't know that we're pushing the science forward in the way that uh, labs at MIT were really pushing forward sort of CRISPR science, uh, but uh, we're benefiting tremendously from the work that's, that is being and was done by, by those labs. Another question, how do you see the role of radiation therapy changing as immunotherapy treatments become more available? Any thoughts on that, Nick? Um, oh. Yeah, well, I can uh, talk a little bit about, just a tiny bit about uh, um, uh, uh, radiation therapy and immunotherapy, I think are, I mean, uh, and just like when a radiation therapy uh, has been complementary to um, uh, chemotherapy, I think, there's ways, you know, I think more therapeutic options are better in that there's ways to uh, combine them and, and make them synergistic. And so I think um, in general, um, having immunotherapy as kind of another uh, method that can be combined with certain um, uh, med medicines, whether chem chemotherapy or, or radiation, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, synergy there. Anybody else on that one? I, I would just echo what Dan said. You know, it's a, um, a really exciting time for in immunotherapy in general, uh, and we're a lot, there's lots of combination trials and, and some of the early stuff combining radiation therapy with with uh, immunotherapy is really encouraging. So I, I think uh, both it'll take on its traditional role where it's it's uh, used widely and, and has effectiveness uh, in a lot of different cancer types. But I think in combination with immunotherapies. Uh, there's going to be a number of patients who benefit greatly from that. So the radiation will kill off some cells and send signals to alert the immune system or what? I what? think that's the idea. I mean, some of the most impressive data is, is this idea that you can irradiate one tumor uh, in, in a, maybe a, a site that's very easily accessible and then give immunotherapy and actually get shrinking of other tumors. This is called the abscopal effect. And, and those data, well, it's still pretty rare. It's happening much more when you, when you do that combination. And that's a really exciting idea because you no longer say have to radiate the brain, you might be able to actually trigger a response. And so that's really an amazing uh, thing if it, if it comes to fruition. So uh, I, would, I would say that in that combination, you might be able to do some really unique things uh, that, that uh, immunotherapy alone can't do. That would be fantastic. And obviously the, the goal is to, to help more and more people uh, and, and with longer and longer lasting benefits. Um, just a big, in, in more cancers. So big challenges ahead. Um, question here for Dr. Heller. Uh, do you see nanosensors being used for predictive purposes as well as for treatment? I.e., is everyone going to swallow a 25 year pill at age 18 and have it, you know, take care of us? <laughs> um, I think uh, it, there's a lot of work going in that direction. And, um, and I think actually there's a, there's a sensor that came out uh, from uh, uh, Bob Langer's lab on a, a, where, uh, where someone swallows a a pill and uh, and 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 you get some some measurements that can be uh, uh, that you can get outside the body. So um, my lab is kind of working on implantable sensors that that talk to wearables, um, and so we we think about that a lot uh, uh, as well. Um, right now, uh, 
where, where Fitbits can measure um, uh, things like, uh, or, or iWatches can measure things like uh, pulse and uh, heart rate uh, uh, and uh, you know, blood oxygenation maybe. And then um, for, for ones that are a little bit further along and then can we then in, uh, combine them with say an implanted sensor that measures a marker, a, a biomarker of a disease. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot of work going on in that direction. A lot of uh, uh, people are excited. I think the funding is starting to come from vendor capital and, and people who really want to take that to the clinic. So I think uh, it's not going away as long as there's funding to keep the, the work up uh, on both the science side and the, and, and, and develop, uh, the technology development side. I think we're going to see a lot of exciting things really soon. And then there's Eric Alm, also at MIT, who's uh, working on the stuff that comes out. So he wants toilet sensors <laughs> for uh, 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 what, what I, we can tell. That has <laughs> been, uh, that has been uh, 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 I, I, clinicians have talked talk to me and said, can you make a sensor that, that uh, goes in the toilet and can measure uh, uh, and, and, and you can get uh, samples that way? And I been thinking about that. I haven't started my lab quite in that direction yet, but there is definite, um, the, definitely clinicians who, who, who believe that that uh, is, is a way that um, it can go. And I, I tend to believe them. So I think there's ways to get uh, samples that way, non-invasively. And, right. uh, and so that, that's good. And that would be primarily for diagnostics or seeing if something is effectively, uh, is, is having an effect? Or what? I think, um, it could definitely, definitely, it could be for diagnostics uh, because um, uh, now we're getting uh, better at, at, at looking at things like uh, uh, exosomes, excreted RNA, DNA, and so there are ways to do it uh, diagnostically. I think most of the types of information people are going to want is, is uh, has to do with maybe a risk factor. So if someone has a risk factor or they're being treated for a disease or uh, there's a risk of recurrence of something like cancer, then there's uh, definitely a reason to uh, to measure, uh, maybe more further down the line would be things like screening at, at, at early stages. Um, and so the question is always, how much data do you really want to get from a, uh, and, and, you know, hypochondriacs are going to start to <laughs> love getting a lot of data or hate it. So, um, so I, I think at, at first there's definitely uh, reasons where someone, if someone has a risk factor, one can, can do kind of real time measurements and get, get kind of say recurrence of cancer much earlier um, uh, than one could in, in, the, in the past. So that the hope right. is that those kind of technologies will come online. That'd be great. Uh, there's an, another follow-up question here to that about ingested sensors. Um, what about security? Are we gonna be hacked for our, uh, our swallowed sensors? Do we have to worry about that? Well, I think uh, more problematic is, is, uh, is when that information leaves the, leaves the sensor, um, where you know where are you going to send it? Are you going to send it to the patient? Are you going to send it to, to the doctor uh, directly? And uh, and so I worry more about too much information is at, you know that the patient really doesn't want to get, or um, or will the doctor be inundated with too much information? So we have to worry about that kind of flow of information. To me, more than hacking, just because hacking might happen on a you know could happen to a whole institution, and that's bad in general, and that could happen right now. And then, and, and there have been data leaks, patient data uh, leaking in certain institutions. Um, uh, and then there's also, but hacking kind of on the individual scale where one person start to broadcast their, their data might happen, you know, in, a, in, in uh, you know, once in a while. But I think that in general, it's not going to be, um, you know, that everybody's data starts getting ha hacked from their own sense implanted sensors uh, or, or ingestible sensors, I don't see that being as much of a problem. Just might hack the president's sensors or something. Uh, yeah, that's, no, but, they'll have to have an extra level of encryption. Right. Um, switching gears again a little bit, what do you think of the technique of removing the red blood cells and beefing them up? Somebody asks. I don't know if that's Hersha for you. Is that? Uh, I don't know that I can comment much on that. Um, there are certain diseases which may lead to de defects in red blood cells, and there's lots of um, clinical trials and um, uh, new technology that's being done, such as gene therapy for hemophiliacs, things like that. So there is a lot of real-life application of that 
process that's currently um, being tested and, and looking like it might be actually quite successful. So I think that they're, I'm not really sure what they mean by that. Is it like um, for doping so that you're better athletically or because you want to cure hemophilia or hemoglobinopathies, but these things um, actually might provide benefit to people so that um, they're not subject to the current treatments that actually can be um, uh, shortening life on a day-to-day -day basis um, and actually provide and uh, a means for uh, these patients to survive. So it's coming and it's being tested and it looks quite positive. Great. And are there specific types of leukemia that you see as sort of the lowest hanging fruit or the, the, the likeliest to be addressed or cured ideally first? So um, in children, there's been a lot of uh, um, headway that's been made with acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. Um, in adults, the poster child of uh, new developments and treatment has been chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And some of that stems from the fact that um, the patient samples are actually quite accessible and easy to attain. Um, however, with the new treatments and the way they're designed where patients may go on novel oral treatments um, for years on end without any interruption in treatment, the, that resource is actually becoming scarcer as the treatments become more effective and the samples um, become less available. So now we're mainly capturing samples at relapse um, and therefore we're not really understanding in time how things are changing unless we're trying to sample the samples on a routine basis. We're trying to do this, but obviously if the treatment's working, your sample um, ability to sample becomes less and less. As a result, um, there are a, a lot of, there's a lot more headway being made in the realm of what I would say elderly um, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, and uh, typically younger patients are treated with very aggressive um, treatments that uh, usually patients uh, under the age of 70 or 65 may not be able to tolerate. And as a result, those patients um, were not given very many good options as um, uh, for treatment. However, there's been recent um, treatments that are now available, um, which means that we would be getting these patients to the clinic rather than um, having them um, either go to palliative care or to their family doctor to be cared for. And therefore the access to those samples now may actually increase and therefore people can and start studying them um, because they have an, they have access to the sample and interventions going to be made and we can start looking at this patient population because you know they may not have the same disease as the younger patients and and we want to know how each patient's um, age a medical condition actually contributes to their response to treatment and so I think that's the the next low hanging fruit um, I mean you have to take out the chronic myelogenous leukemia, which is technically um, very well managed and almost cured, and patients don't have to be on treatment um, for long periods of time um, any longer, as long as um, they're in what's called a molecular remission. And so, you know, those are three different um, kind of vignettes of where treatment for leukemia has come, um, the least advanced being made in acute myeloid leukemia, um, both in the young patients and the old patients. So I think um, with some of the newer agents um, that are targeting the apoptotic pathway, BCL2 mimetics, which are actually gaining some um, uh, evidence in both trials and um, off-label use actually um, uh, may um, provide new treatment options for a patient population we traditionally did not have treatments for. Right. We've, we tend to forget in the general public how important basic data is, um, but obviously <laughs> drives your work. Nick, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, nothing specific. I, I think that was a really good summary. The only thing I would say that maybe um, is that may be relevant is that uh, uh, some of the therapies I think that are coming online for, for the leukemias are, are really very uh, exciting. Some of these CAR therapies and uh, yes. the ability to modify T cells and actually change uh, the the make your own treatment essentially is a really exciting thing for especially as an engineering background from that we all get from MIT it's, it's a really exciting idea. Uh, I forgot so I about think, the car T, sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think that that will really uh, just add more excitement to this field. Great and are any of you looking at all at breast cancer might your work inform breast cancer research? Yeah, Nick, uh, you, yeah. In, in, in my lab we're we're mostly thinking about targeted treatment to breast cancer um, but um, 
and and so we've been uh, making you know, nanoparticles to try to um, target you put targeted therapies into um, uh, into particles to tar to target the drug to breast cancer improve the the drug and to reduce uh, its side effects and so we've been thinking a lot about that and we're collaborating with breast cancer researchers here um, and then in general we're looking at you know implantable diagnostics and different types of uh, of diagnostics to get uh, to detect it early the hope is to uh, my kind of my labs when we started we realized our we, we thought our, our biggest um, uh, goal was to try to either try, make targeted treatment to metastatic cancer or try to catch it before it, it happens and so that's been what we, we think about a lot CAR T for breast cancer or uh, solid tumors gonna gonna fall to CAR T at some point um, I think that there is definite uh, uh, possibility there I think um, uh, I, and I and I think uh, I think people are are thinking about um, are, are making are doing these trials uh, or starting these trials a lot. Um, the the question with uh, with T cell therapy in, in general with solid tumors is just how do you make sure that the T cells get in there and uh, uh, in, into these solid tumors and um, and so some of the drug delivery people are are thinking about that uh, a lot now. Mm -hmm. Pulling back a little bit, we have some more policy related questions. Um, do you leverage publicly available clinical and other data in your research? And if so, how? Anybody have any? Yes, yeah, so I do. Um, so we have the luxury of um, having a lot of centralized database in the province of Manitoba um, that are clinical in nature. So we have access um, to uh, hospital uh, billing information, costs of different um, treatments, and then the patient, basic patient uh, demographics. And we have a cancer registry. And then in our CLL clinic, we have a clinic specific database. So all of our correlative sciences um, can be tapped into this wealth of data. And so we try and um, when we look at in vivo um, and in vitro responses and how new either new treatments are implemented in clinical practice or how uh, cells in a dish respond to treatment, we actually have the ability to know their stage um, and uh, have they received previous treatment, any genetic abnormalities that are normally followed. Um, and then we can over time look at their survival data as well. So um, it's public in the sense that if you apply for it, you can um, access it, uh, but there are lots of hoops to jump through. You guys do do any of that, or otherwise I'll jump to the. We've got two final questions in our last four minutes here. Um, the first one is: Have you personally seen the effects of changing immigration policy on your grad student or postdoc population? Any so, of you? I'll, I'll comment on that. We um, not my uh, employees in the in the lab have not been affected, but there is quite a bit of. Uh, Anxiety amongst members in the in the in the department, uh, students and trainees. I think it's been a it was especially when a lot of this first happened. It's been a very uh, unnerving time for them, and and even more than just directly people being affected and, and um, unable to work. It, it, it's also just this uncertainty that's been very hard for a large fraction of of, of people who come from foreign uh, places. So we've been trying to be as reassuring. I mean, obviously. Uh, Yale as a as a as a university has way more power than than any of us do, uh, but I think uh, as as a community we try and we try and come together and try and be supportive and uh, and, and so far uh, as far as I know no one has been adversely affected but uh, it is a concern I think. Versha, you guys might benefit from uh, some of the unrest and, and uncertainty here, I guess. Uh, yes, we, um, it, it's interesting. We do get a lot of uh, foreign applications, um, but at the same time, we're trying to recruit local talent as well. So we're open to anybody who wants to study. <laughs> um, and the last question I'll pose to all three of you, I guess. Uh, what advice would you give my 19 year old daughter also at MIT who wants to go into biotech? What major should she pick? Well, I can I can address that a little bit. Uh, I was a history major in undergrad, so um, and that was actually really great for um, uh, for learning to uh, write. And so I'd say that's a good one. But uh, maybe a little more seriously, I would I would uh, uh, especially maybe in an MIT community, I say it, it's great to be in a quantitative field because it gives you kind of a lot of uh, great uh, ammunition for going um, 
uh, from there to others. So, uh, you know, engineering, electrical engineering, uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of put, put you in a good place to uh, address so many uh, uh, questions quantitatively. You know, uh, you know, a lot of bioinformatics is really uh, is is really coming online now, and in, in, in many uh, in, in pharma as well as uh, academia, and, and has been there for a little while. So, I'd say if you can use your quantitative skills, you have quantitative skills, and you can use them. I would definitely think about that uh, first. Not to say that you can't go into you know biology as well. Great, thanks, Versha. Oops, your mic's off. Different path in that um, I did medicine and um, all my clinical training first, and then I started doing research a little bit more heavily um, at the bench side. And so I think it really depends on what you want and what your interests are. Um, and I think it's important to realize that the system can mold to meet your needs as long as you know what you can access. Um, uh, and I think she's got a wealth of um, opportunity where she is. I'm, I didn't come from that. I was given an opportunity and I ran with it. And I think um, that's really the, you know, for someone who's young, they need to have their head in it and they want to, they have to want to do it. Um, and if they don't have those in mind or doing it because um, they think that's the right thing to do, they may not get to where they want to be. So dad shouldn't be too pushy about, uh, her mom, <laughs> about what, what to major in. <laughs> Nick, we'll give you the last word. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, I, I'll, I'll echo what Versha said. I think uh, doing something that you're passionate about is probably the number one thing in terms of uh, in terms of picking a, a, a topic to actually work on uh, and, and pursue as a major. But I think the other thing, uh, which MIT does a very good job of, is, is actually giving access to the labs and actually go and do it. You know, uh, I had undergrads my entire time uh, at, at MIT, and, and they were some of the most amazing. Uh, researchers that I encountered and they had, you know, some of them had no experience, but they just wanted to do something and they took advantage of that ability to come in and do it. And some of them went on to do research, some went on to med school, but they all, I think, gained a lot uh, from just the experience of going into the labs. And there's a lot of opportunities to do that for students at MIT. So I, that's what I would focus on. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, on behalf of the Alumni Association, thanks for tuning into this faculty forum online and to our alumni pa panelists from the University of Manitoba, Yale and Cornell. Um, if anybody has any lingering questions, we can forward them to the panelists. Uh, and you can tweet about today's chat using the hashtag at MIT Better World and send follow up questions or feedback to alumni at MIT.edu. Thanks so much for watching.